First of all, fellas, thank you so much for the support on the Season 4 Rewind. The whole concept of going through every season of League is something I kept in the back of my mind for some time, and I'm so happy to finally be able to explore the world of League's past with you guys. So now that we've got Season 4 checked off, we can now move on to Season 5. The season of pirates, beefy boys, and a whole host of even more pro-play exclusive champions, many of which have become staples of the franchise today. We got Kalista, Rek'Sai, Bard, Echo, Tom Kench, and Kindred, and following the success of Scion's rework in the year prior, we also got to see an increase in reworks too, with Tristana, Gangplank, and FRANCE! What is th that? as well as a multitude of smaller reworks during the first ever class update. In League Zoomer terms, Riot would do a bunch of mid-scope updates for champions of the same class at the same time. Assassins, tanks, mages, and in Season 5's case, juggernauts. So in this, we'd see updates for Skarner, Darius, Garen, and Mordekaiser. No, 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 not, not that Mordekaiser. This Mordekaiser. <laughs> Now before we get started, I do want to get a couple things out of the way. Despite explicitly saying in the title that it was a champion rewind, a common form of critique from the last video was that I didn't mention any of the other content released during that season. And uh... Yeah, I kind of agree. I think it's important to go over that stuff. So, while Season 5 wasn't such a massive shift in direction like its predecessor season, many notable aspects of League that exist to this day started here. We got a couple visual updates for Alistar and Cassidy. The Mastery system was introduced, although back then you could only get up to Mastery 5. The first Chromas were released of varying quality. Peace. The bestest boy Scuttlecrab joined the Rift roster. A few notable skin releases including DJ Sona and the first iterations of D&D and Project came out this year. We got three, count them, three new game modes. Black Market Brawlers, more on that when we talk about Gangplank. Nemesis Draft, which saw players pick their opponent's champions. So yeah, nothing but old Urgot, Galio, and Yorick every game. That mode was fucking garbage. And the fan favorite, One For All, which, you know, Back then, it wasn't available for literally months at a time. And lastly, the introduction of staple items like elixirs, titanic hydra, dead man's plate, ZZ Rock portal. I'll never forgive them for what they took from us. <laughs> Speaking of items, just like pretty much every preseason, we would also get brand new jungle items, including the infamous Sated Devourer. TLDR, imagine Master Yi's double strike passive was an item. It didn't last very long because it was fucking broken, but it was quite fun, with my favorite champion to build it on being Tom Kench. Cause yes, when this man's first release, Jungle was unironically his best role. And that's really all I'm gonna say about Tom Kench in this video. I already talked about him at length in the season 2021 rewind, both old and new versions, so it seems kind of pointless to talk about him again here. Instead, let's focus on the other stuff, shall we? Let's finally dive in to the champions of season five. Kalista, released November 20th, 2014. Damage type AD. Role, AD carry, pro play champion, Corpse Bride, Revenge. Up until recently, thanks in no small part to an electric fruit fly, Kalista was THE pro play exclusive ADC. Not saying she still doesn't hold that title, a near 80% presence at the 2022 World Championship play-ins, yet barely rising above a 2% pick rate in solo queue should speak volumes. And to be honest, I was terrified to play Kalista again. I consider myself a flex player, I dabble in quite many a champion, but ADC is my least favorite role by far. Most of the ADCs I play are the non-traditional ones, that or I just build them full AP mid lane because I'm just that base. But Kalista, I had played this champion in over four years, with my last memory of her being after I just received Blood Moon Kalista from a mystery gift. And listen, when your worst role is ADC and you're playing one of the hardest ADC champions in the game, you're naturally not going to have a very great time. And I didn't, because I distinctly remember one of my teammates seeing my score and telling me to refund my skin. I don't deserve it. If only that asshole could see me now! But fast forward a few years, I'm older, wiser, and with even more skins at my disposal, so naturally I should do better, right? In Azir's case, even though I lost nearly every game, I continued to play him because he was fun. The mechanic of the shuffle and unorthodox play style clicked with me, so I was still enjoying myself despite the fact I was losing all the time. But Kalista, I don't know, man, I already have tendonitis. I'm not overly fond of attack moving my way to full on carpal tunnel by becoming a Kalista main. That, and of course, even more so than Azir, she is a team play champion. If you and your support aren't on the same page, you're gonna have a bad time. I'm going in. Okay. What the hell? 
I just don't vibe with Kalista gameplay wise. After this video's over, I have no idea when I'll be playing her again, if ever. I still love the character from a design standpoint though, and when my Ruination book finally actually fucking gets here, I'll be enthralled to learn more about her character and her relationship to Ladros. But to me, she'll always just be another champion held back by the mercy of pro players, something she and the next champion release would have very much in common. Rek'Sai Released December 11th, 2014 Damage Type AD Role Jungler Bruiser Sand Shark Best girl. Common misconception I want to make clear first of all, void monster names are not their actual names, they don't really care about shit like that, they're named by Shirimans. The Great Sai Desert is ruled by the Void Queen Rex Sai, and her brood hive is called the Zare Sai. That's why Kaisa's name sounds like a void monster, she just has a Shiriman name, she's not actually a monster even if her comic would like you to believe otherwise. But Rek'Sai is very special, one of the few monster champions in League that are actually female, and no, Elise and Evelyn don't count. I'm talking full-on inhuman female monsters. So often in fiction we identify anything non-human automatically as male, so it's nice to see some actual girl monsters on occasion. That being said, despite my praise, I don't play Rek'Sai very often anymore. I mean, I did when she first released, I played her a ton top lane, because yes, that used to be a viable option. And yes, I tried playing Rek'Sai top again for this video. And yes, it did not go very well. And yet again, we have another pro play exclusive champion. That's five in a row now, although with Rek'Sai, I never really understood why. With Braum, Nar, Zir, and Kalista, it was easy. They all have big team fighting ults or abilities reliant on clear communication. But Rek'Sai, I guess it was her old ult? It wasn't always the glorified Lee Sin Q it is today. Old Rek'Sai ult used to let her teleport to any one of her tunnels on the map near instantaneously, with travel time being the exact same no matter how far it was away from her. So I assume she was broken for pro players because giving a jungler that level of map pressure seems kind of insane, but then why is she so underpicked in solo queue to this day even after the ult change? Personally for me, she felt pretty alright to play, healing from her fury bar is a joke of what it used to be, but it's strange to see what was once such a prominent pro play champion disappear off the radar almost entirely, with champions like Leeson and Graves likely being her permanent replacements. But hey, if Rek'Sai ever has at least one claim to fame, it will be that either she somehow took priority over coming to LOR first over Kai'Sa, or the jet ski and pool party rack side jet ski's pretty fucking funny. <laughs> hey, you know what else was funny? The rework riot would release next. Tristana. Rework January 28th, 2015. Damage type AD. Roll, AD carry, mid laner, explosives expert. Her bravery often drives her into the heat of battle, where she blows away her targets with her trusty cannon boomer. <laughs> Huh? Weird thing is at the time of Tristana's rework, Riot had recently updated a ton of champion splash arts, Tristana included. And while they did make a second revised version at the time for this rework, they pulled it from PvE instead opting to use the new one as a placeholder for quite a good while. I mean, that seems kind of unnecessary. Surely the first draft couldn't have been that bad, could it? I understand. Another thing you may not know, originally Tristana was not actually a Yordle. If Vigar, Corky, and Old Heimerdinger weren't evidence enough, originally Riot had no fucking idea what Yordles were even supposed to be. And as such, these champions were classified under different races and species before eventually all being retconned into Yordles. As for Trist, originally she was classified as a Megling. Ugh, I felt gross just saying that. Why does it sound like a slur? Gameplay changes as well were a bit weird. It was more along the lines of an Ezreal style situation where only one ability actually changed, that being her bomb. Because before, it was just... Is that it? I don't have a lot to say about Tristana because, well, there isn't a lot to her. I do miss the AP jump move technique, but even with her less fun AD build, you can still get some high level dopamine moments out of playing Leapfrog with your opponents. <laughs> I'm jumping. Leapfrog, baby! <laughs> High level dopamine, huh? Well, that reminds me quite a lot of the champion that Riot would release next. Bard. Released March 12th, 2015. Damage type AP. Roll, support, mage, Celestial Pillowfort, 
barrel. What the fuck? You can't honestly tell me you almost threw worlds by picking Bard at the last possible second just to pick Ash as your esports skin, you Genshin Impact playing piece of shit! That was uncalled for and incredibly disrespectful. I'm sorry, guys. I promise I won't taint your ears with the words of that Satan game ever again. Now, Bard. <laughs> what the fuck even is Bard, man? Maybe this is just me, but I absolutely love character designs where I cannot immediately tell what it is I'm looking at. Not necessarily in a cosmic horror, what the fuck is that kind of way, more so in the Snorlax or Shar Ishvalda kind of way. I can pinpoint aspects about what these are supposed to be based on, but they're not a dead giveaway like Caterpie or Paolumu. And Bard is like that to me. His design is cohesive and simple, yet complex and inciting imagination. Not to mention, he doesn't talk. It's just a bunch of horn sounds. And his meeps as well. They're definitely saying something, but what are they saying? Well, using my incomparable linguistics expertise, I believe I can translate these rapscallion speech into phrases the more common folk could understand. <laughs> Ooh, toe. Shally. Good friend of theirs. A good day. But on gameplay, man, I don't know if you remember what it was like when Bard first came out, but everybody hated this guy. What do you mean you're a support who purposely leaves your ADC alone to 2v1? What do you mean he has only one damaging ability? What do you mean his ult can single-handedly ruin a team fight for his own team? This should be one of the default report tip. No, no, probably doesn't happen often enough. So you gotta, yeah, you just type it in. Bard. So naturally, I fucking love this guy. You could use Bard ult as a team saving ability to give yourself or an ally a free Zanyas, or you could be like me. Dory Man, I'll save you! Oh, <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> he saved it. The second option's a lot more fun, and that's how I describe Bard. Fun. He's just a fun character from head to peg leg. Playing him again for this video reminded me just how much fun he is, and now that I'm so close to Mastery 7, I'll definitely be playing more Bard in the future. Speaking of fun, players didn't really get to have much of that during Riot's next release. Echo. Released May 29th, 2015. Damage type AP. Role, jungler, assassin, arcane goat. Time travel! What? I, I see this as an absolute win. While we'd seen champions like Yasuo with his wind wall or Rek'Sai with her summoner spell for an ult, I think Echo was the point of no return for a lot of people when they said... Now this is just getting absurd. Why would you give an assassin a free escape tool that also does a ton of damage? Okay, that doesn't count. Echo is an actual champion in League of Legends. That is a coping mechanism for sentient earthworms. And while Echo was quite strong on release, the worst was yet to come. In only a year's time, top lane tank Echo would enter the meta, and all our mentals would be the worst because of it. He still had insane levels of damage, but now you flat out couldn't kill him. I mean, Riot did. I don't even remember what they did. Probably base damage nerfs or something. Yes! But Tank Echo hasn't seen the spotlight in some time. Instead, we have our modern day Echo jungle. Unlike Darius, Garen, Morgana, Zyra, Mordekaiser, and a whole slew of other champions Riot tried to force into the jungle, Jungle Echo is really the only one that sticked. So, well, in fact, it's become his permanent role. And I mean, just look at that passive damage. It's no wonder. It's actually rare these days to see him in the role he was originally designed for. And while champions will often branch out into other roles over time, having their old one flat out replaced is kind of strange. Just like how it's also strange, Echo has had three different voice actors. Anthony Del Rio in League. It's not how much time you have, it's how you use it. Foot Moose for his true damage skin. Oh yeah, start it up. Oh la, rev it up. And Reed Shannon in Arcane, Convergence, and Legends of Runeterra. Doubt me. I love that. But personally though, after playing so much LOR and watching Arcane, Reed is Echo to me now. So much so that upon replaying him for this video, hearing his in-game voice lines just sounded wrong. But that's enough about Echo. We need to talk about the next champion, one that released with one of the best events in League of Legends history. One might say I wrapped up this segment just in the nick of time. For those who didn't laugh at that joke, here's a fun fact for you. I am currently 100 meters away from your location and approaching rapidly. Start running. Gangplank. 
Clank. Reworked July 21st, 2015. Damage type AD. Roll top laner, mid laner. Supports, if you're Tobias Fate, Psychopath. Oh! Give me! The thing I always liked about Gangplank is that anyone can play him. Anyone can spam Q while laning phase and do moderately well. Will you cut that out? But the moment you're out of lane, when you have to actually land barrel combos, that's how you tell the esteemed captains apart from the ordinary seamen. Do not fucking take that out of context. Gangplank is just one of those champions that feels so satisfying to play. Big damage and big money, what's not to like? I mean, I didn't really like how the item rework made it so you don't have to actually be skillful at him to be successful anymore, but, you know, tomato to more joke. <laughs> well, GP's gameplay is all well and good, now we get to the good stuff. Many of you might might be aware of this, but League used to have actually good events. NOT SCIENTIFICALLY POSSIBLE! Yeah. I know, hard to believe. Odyssey, Star Guardian, you name it. Content rich and filled with fun and interesting ideas I'll remember for the rest of my days. But one that holds a very special place in my memory is Burning Tides. We got Butcher's Bridge, the Bilgewater-themed ARAM map, Black Market Brawlers, a wholly unique game mode where you earn Silver Serpents to unlock upgrades for your minions, turning them to Bilgewater-themed animals as well as brand new items. Hell, the unique item in this mode, Dead Man's Plate, was so popular they made it into a real Whoa. item. Not to mention a ton of Bilgewater-themed skins, most notably skins for Graves and TF as their younger selves, but we also got Captain Fortune. Now why is Captain Fortune important? Well, for that we need to take one look at the Stinky Pirate Man. You may notice something strange about the old Gangplank footage and his champion spotlight, that in every single one, they're using the Captain Gangplank skin. When Gangplank's Rerick first released, the default skin we have now didn't even exist. Captain Gangplank was the default skin. But then, only a week into his release, Misfortune killed him, not just in the lore, but in the game itself. Only a week into a new champion's release and Riot disabled them, and not because of any bug or issue, but because in the lore, he was dead. If only that were true today. If only. If only. It didn't last very long though, because only a few days later it was revealed that no, the Saltwater Scourge won't die so easily. With a robotic arm and having to build his entire empire from the ground up again, Gangplank was back. And anyone who played even a single game of him pre-death got the Captain Gangplank skin for free. What a fucking awesome event, dude. And what a crazy risk it was to pull off something like disabling your brand new champion on purpose. It's why so many people had such high hopes for Ruination because of how great Burning Tides was. No matter how broken he gets or how often he one-shots my ADC, Gangplank will always hold a special place in my heart. It's a sentiment I don't share with the champion that Riot would rework next. Reworked August 6th, 2015. Damage type, AD. Roll, top laner, bruiser, serial murderer, I'm French. Prior to this video, besides the two champions I have never played once, Fiora was the champion I had the least mastery on in the entire game. And of course, with me playing this incredibly high skill champion, having little to no experience, I should naturally get my ass kicked, right? Yes. Yes, I did. I got fucking demolished. And then I got two items. Take a closer look at these clips, okay? Look at how many times I mess up, how many vitals I miss, how many autos I cancel. I am fucking up my play patterns a hundred times a second, and I'm still winning. At least Yone can miss his Q. At least Yi's damage mitigation doesn't do damage back. At least Jax has to build items to do true damage. I despise this champion with every fiber of my being, and on top of that, she's a snarky asshole the whole time. Confidence and ego can be a funny and interesting character trait if done right, but she's literally French. It was doomed to fail from the start. But it's not like her old version was much better either. Her old ult was basically Master Yi Q on steroids, but personally, old Fiora ult was more like a Chuck E. Cheese, you see. New Fiora ult, it's more like a five-star five dinner. There are several champions that immediately tilt me before laning phase has even begun, and trust me, after playing a lot of Cassante oh, recently, that tilt has grown exponentially for the Baguette Bandit tenfold. But, you know, I hate to end this video on a sour note. Thankfully, there was still one more champion release awaiting us near the end of the year.
Released October 10th, 2015. Damage type AD. Roll, Jungler, Marksman, the Grim Reaper's persona. You ever get the feeling something really bad is about to happen? As a concept, Kindred is just so fucking cool. It's a common mistake that they are the sole Grim Reaper of Runeterra when that couldn't be further from the truth. There are spirits like Kindred all over the place, the Astral Fox for Targon, the Wings and the Wave for Ionia, and the Fading Icon for the Shadow Isles. And while not all regions favor both parts of Kindred equally, Noxus likes the Wolf more than Demacia likes Lamb, Kindred is still the most powerful of these spirits because they are believed near worldwide. The Fading Icon, on the other hand, well... Let's just say a god of death isn't much useful in a place where nobody is alive to begin with. I think the idea behind Kindred is far better than anything League of Legends could possibly reproduce. One look at Eloir or even her default splash on, you can see just how big Wolf is actually supposed to be, yet in game he's barely noticeable. It's why when most people refer to Kindred they say, she, because Lamb is the only part of Kindred that most people acknowledge. Hell, the only part of Kindred that really does anything in game. Wolf is over here nicking people's elbows while Lamb is firing fire tip bullets at 100 rounds per minute. I've come to accept, much like Anna V, or a soul, their true potential will never be realized in a MOBA like League. And while I know that Project L roster leak was fake, and honestly, I'm kind of glad it was, I hadn't stopped to consider just how cool Kindred could potentially be in that game. I think Kindred's kind of been done dirty in recent years. Give the fellas another shot, Riot. If not me, then do it for PO Sick. Mans literally went pro and won worlds just to ensure Kindred got more than one skin every three years. Well, there you have it. The Champions of Season 5, and honestly, while I do like the Champions of Season 4, I think this season was the true beginning of the golden age for modern champion design. Not necessarily gameplay-wise, but every single new champion was so different and unique from the last, it was exciting to anticipate the next release because realistically we had no idea what to expect. With that, let's take one last look back to give our appreciation for the Season 5 roster, shall we? The Jump Rope World Champion, the Sand Castle Crasher, the Bouncy Castle Crasher, the Collect the Thon Completionist, the Act 3 Spoiler, the Saltwater Scallywag, the French Fry Fiend, and the Lamb Who Cried Wolf. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to do another Season Rewind this year before the 2022 one, but hey, I have a lot of fun making these kinds of videos, and if you like them, be sure to let me know. You could comment, or like, or subscribe, or support me on Patreon or something. Why is being a YouTuber so fucking cringe? In any case, fellas, as always, these are just my stupid, silly opinions. Be sure to let me know yours down in the comments. What champions do you love from Season 5? What champions do you hate? And maybe after this video, which of these are you willing to give another try if given the chance? That's all from me, though, fellas. It's time to start actually preparing to talk about the insanity that was this year's champion releases, but until then, I'll see you in the next video.